the driver reached over the back and put his hand towards mine and said, uh, welcome aboard. And uh, I said, thanks. And I didn't know that I was shaking the hands of the guy that later on was going to try and murder me. My guest today is John Daly, the subject of the documentary Escape from Room 18, which tells his fascinating life story of how he, a Jewish man, was forced into joining a neo-Nazi gang and the devastating repercussions of what happened once his fellow gang members discovered his Jewish identity. John, thanks so much for joining the podcast. How are you doing? Thank you so very much for having me on and all of your listeners and those that watch for being involved. Okay, well, listen, it's our pleasure. And I I think you have one of the most interesting stories, not just of any guest, but of any person I've come across. Um, I was absolutely enthralled with this documentary and, and articles about your life. Let's start from the beginning. You grew up in Florida. You were initially part of an anti-racist skinhead gang. So let's talk about that. How and why did you join this gang and why actively decide to go for the skinhead look? Because some people might think anti-racist skinhead. That doesn't make sense to me. That's very true. There are a lot of groups out there that are anti-racist. Skinheads actually started off as an anti-racist movement. So the thought that it could be racist was something that was uh, totally blows the mind of all the old skinheads. Mm. Like that can't be. When I got involved, I was invited to... Um, a birthday party from a friend of mine from high school. And when I got there, there were a group of guys, none of them had hair. And uh, they went around the table and explained that they were skinheads. And I said, man, I'm sure that's cool, but uh, I'm Jewish. And so one lifted up his shirt and showed me a white hand and a black hand cracking a swastika in two. And he said, oh no, we're not those types of skinheads. We're against racism. And at that moment, I felt safe to be around them. Um, the skinhead look today is mainly because of, uh, I've, I travel with a lot of medication in two more days, I'm gonna be on a plane. And uh, just in case there are any questions at that, as I go through customs, what's what's your story? They can just look at my head and see a giant, massive brain, tu- brain surgery scar across the top. Yeah. Um, I just be like, all right, keep on going. Yeah. I mean, we d- listen, we will get to that. Um, your your numerous brain surgeries, which have played a huge part in your life. But but let's let's stay on this for a while. That's that's to keep the listeners engaged if they weren't already enthralled with with your stories of being in a skinhead gang. There's more. So so you're in this anti racist skinhead gang. Now you mentioned how a racist skinhead gang, the Aryan Youth Force gang, essentially took over uh your anti racist one. Can you talk a bit about how that happened? Two of my friends went to Orlando, Florida, which was about an hour away from where we lived in Ocala, Florida. Uh, and in Orlando, they went to just a punk rock club. And in the club, they met some uh, skinheads. And the skinheads approached them and explained that they were white, white supremacist skinheads, asked my friends where they were from, who they were, who they were associated with. And they said, nobody, because we're just associated with ourselves, if you will, not a larger national organization. And these guys said, OK. And they spent the weekend with them, just hanging out and playing with them. Uh, drinking when i say playing i was thinking basketball because i know they did some uh shirts versus skins games um and they said okay we want the names and addresses of your friends and that's how one day there was a knock on my door and there were three neo-nazi skinheads standing outside which i could tell by their regalia and different things they had on their clothing and tattoos and things like that yeah that's how it began and they and they said what you're with us now when they knocked on the door I thought being Jewish that initially that it was an attack. And since I had three brothers inside my mom and dad, I'm like, all right, do I let these guys in so they can just attack anybody they want to, or do I leave with them? And then whatever happens, happens someplace safe for my family. I got in the car and off we drove off. And as we drove off, each one told me a story of someone who used to be involved and quit hanging out and was mysteriously shot or mysteriously run over or mysteriously caught on fire. And uh, I'm like, wow. That's crazy. And I understood what they were saying without saying it. And then one reached, and then one, the driver reached over the back, and put his hand towards mine, and said, uh, "Welcome aboard." And uh, I said, "Thanks." And I didn't know that I was shaking the hands 
of the guy that later on was going to try and murder me. Oh, dude. Uh, Six months later, yeah. Right. So, so a lot happened within those six months from, from first joining to them attempting to kill you. Within those six months, you gained a lot of respect to the point that by the summer of 1990, you became a highly respected member of the Aryan Youth Force and were made the leader of the Northern Florida branch. What was your reaction when they told you that you were going to become that? Were you honored? That's really hard to answer. In a sense, I was honored. Uh, by then, Aryan Youth Force had joined up with the large organization called American Front. American Front was a nationwide organization, and I started meeting guys that were affiliated all over the United States. So the first question is, why isn't a Jewish guy just get up and run or go hide someplace else? And like, well, this was before Google. You couldn't type into Google, how do I escape a Nazi gang and find help? Mm. There was not a Jewish a JCC, a Jewish community center in the town that I lived in. The synagogue was mostly small and everyone was uh, more or less assimilated and happily assimilated. And uh, there was really nothing for my family to do. I knew law enforcement officers that introduced themselves as being racist. If you need something, contact us. So every avenue that is the 16 year old now in my 40s, I can look back and say, you should have done this. You should have done that. But as a 16 year old, it seemed like every avenue was closed to escape these guys. Um, yeah. Them liking me was basically the fact that I had a job. I was still in school, which most members were not or did not. They either dropped out of school, were kicked out of school. Um, I was still in the honors classes. I had a job because I felt like I just preferred having my own money. They, these guys like to steal. And I would tell them, listen, you're living exactly like the races that you're saying are thieves. And <laughs> you're doing the exact same thing. So how can you be against them? And they live that way. Sure. Which uh, did not make me any friends <laughs> on that level. Yeah. I mean, so this is, this is kind of mad at the moment. So, so you started off, um, in an anti-racist skinhead gang. You're like, these people are cool. It then got amalgamated into a racist or swallowed up by a racist gang. And now you're kind of trapped here. They take you for a, a menacing car ride in which they're like, look, this is what happens when people leave us. So I guess you're with us now. And to top it off, you're Jewish. Were you constantly nervous or worried that this was going to get found out all the time all the time i assumed every time they would start making anti-semitic remarks that they were aimed at me every time they would talk about violence against jews or how there should be violence against jews i always assumed they were turning it towards me mm. and what i would do was i turn the conversation towards another minority um which fortunately by this point in my career, I've been able to go into different uh, organizations and apologize on the behalf of saying, listen, I'm sorry for saying, why don't we attack blacks? Not why don't we attack, but why don't you attack? Or turning their hatred in that direction. Mm. Um, I'm sorry for using the word attack. I never, ever, ever in all the time I was with them said, let's go and come in and, and attack against this race or that race ever. None ever happened in the city I lived in during the time that I was involved, yeah. never. There was never a racial violent attack while I was in my city. Um, yeah, I don't want to reshoot that. That's just, <laughs> that's, that's tumors. Um, so for me being involved with them, yeah, man, it was terrifying all the time. I just assumed at some point they'd find out that I was in, that I was Jewish and would try and kill me. Um, asked my family, my really close friends that knew me to keep it on the down low, to not say anything. Um, made sure when they came to our house, that there was nothing out and about that was in the open that somebody could look at and be like, Oh, well, wow, I know what that is. You know, no star of David, that type of thing, making all sure all that stuff came down. So my house was sterile when somebody would come through and walk and look and they would look and check because they would report on one another. I saw this at such and such, so-and-so's house. What do you think it means? And then that person might catch what's called a boot party where they'd beat them up. And when they fell down, they'd all stand around them and kick them. Skinheads beat each other up a lot. <laughs> did did your did your family have any idea that you were involved with these people? Oh, they definitely got an idea after a while. They definitely got an idea. Yeah. Yeah. I... But I explained to them what was going on, what was happening, and there was really nowhere to go, nothing to do, and they had no explanation uh, or no outside, no escape route, if you will. There's one night my mother sat me down and said, um, John, they're going to hurt you. And I said, look, we've got two choices. One, 
is we can choose, we can have a, we can choose the day that you never see me again. And that's the day that I'll tell them I'm Jewish and then they'll kill me and that, that'll be that. Or it can be a surprise. Which would you prefer? God. Yeah, exactly. Mom started crying and said, surprise. And two weeks later, they found out. I mean, I, I, I don't even know. I can't even imagine what that was like for the both of you. That conversation is so heavy. Um, your, your mother is actually in the documentary Escape from Room 18. And, and there's a moment where she says that prior to joining the gang, as, as a child or maybe you're a teenager, you, you went to uh, Israel's Yad Vashem Holocaust Museum. So, so you had some awareness and education of, of your background and of the Holocaust. How did you reconcile this knowledge with being in a neo-Nazi gang? Did you sort of just have to shove it out of your mind? On that reconcile it, I was a member of an organization that I did not want to be a member of. Mm. <laughs> My local friends used to joke around that I was an officer of one. When I was made the officer of this little, of our area, they used to joke that I was an officer of one because none of us wanted to be in this group. We were just in it, but we did not know a way to say, look, we don't want to be a part of it. So we're all going to take off. Yeah. Uh, and I also worked in the exact opposite direction. There was a group called the social out social outcast skins in Miami, Florida. Um, there was a neo-Nazi gang. There was another gang called the Grudge Skins that was an anti-racist gang that was assassinating them. Like, oh, you're a Nazi? Okay, make a choice, and was killing them. And apparently a group of them were murdered, and you would see Nazis walking around South Florida that uh, guys with Nazi tattoos that were anti-racist. They had just been pulled into the... And it was something that both sides did. To show how strong they were, how powerful they were. Yeah. Uh, now I never saw anybody get shot. I can't say if that was true or not. It was probably just a two inch story because there, there were a lot of teenage stories running around. Mm -hmm. um, and talking with my parents and them knowing what I was involved in, they also knew that if you push too hard, and I got into the group and just disappeared into the group because I felt I was safer there than at home, um, that there was a chance I'd never come back. And so, with my my mother, used to always remind my father love keep the love there and it's something i tell parents everywhere i go make sure your kids feel loved i mean you can't fix a child that doesn't feel loved it, it's something i'm sorry that doesn't sound right you can't fix a child that doesn't feel loved but make sure that your children know that they have a place they feel loved and they have a, a safe place to come back to because if you browbeat them about their choices that and that when they're teenagers when obviously with, you're never more correct in your life than when you're, when you're in a teenager <laughs> or when you're in love. Um, it's the two times that you're sure you know everything about everything and you want no advice from anybody. Um, so for parents, I tell them, look, you have to deal with the fact with the child where he's at or where they're at. Uh, they're very confused. They have a group that is suddenly becoming closer and closer, more like family than their real family because they're there for them. They fight for them. They check on their welfare a lot more often than the family does. You're getting phone calls and nowadays emails, uh, text messages. How are you? Is everything okay? I mean, people looking into you 24 hours a day, it's, it's, you're, you're in a cult after a fashion, that people are constantly involved in your life. You're all listening to the same, yes, dressing the same way, going to the same events, um, 247. I mean, they're always there. You never know when your phone's going to ring. It's going to be somebody saying, come on, we're going out, come with us. We need your help and you'd have to you wouldn't go out the door what do you think would have happened in your case if it wasn't for that love wow that's an excellent question what would i have done if it wasn't for that love probably argue with my parents a lot more than i did <laughs> uh one of the questions you pre-prepared was why did i shave my head i did it because it infuriated my father and it was a fun way as a teenage boy to push back and rebel against them. A lot of what I did back then, I saw even with the anti-racist group, that the more I would shave my head, the more it would upset my dad. And the more it upset my dad, the more I liked it. It was a change of the status quo in the house, if you will. Um, but all of a sudden, I was becoming the, the man of the house or one of the men in the house and not just someone who was told what to do. Sure. I think every teenage boy enjoys that. Definitely. I know I have. Um... I suppose it's different when when you're in a in a gang, 
Um, yes. But it's it's relatable to an extent. What um, I, I really want to know, what did being in a gang actually look like day to day? Like, what did you do? What would that involve in your case? Day to day life in a skinhead gang, I can't tell you now 30 years later what it looks like, but I would assume it's very similar to what it looked like in my day. And that's a lot of drinking, a lot of talking, a lot of planning of what we're going to do, but very little actually doing. Um, Why? We should blow up such and such. Why? Why very little actually doing? There are repercussions to your actions. And sometimes they would think, well, if I do such and such, my parole officer is going to find out about it. I'll go back to jail. Or if I do this, this is what's going to happen to me. And sometimes they would just think, sometimes they would actually think about the repercussions. For the most part, they didn't. Like I have no tattoos. I saw many of my friends get arrested because their tattoos were identifiable. And, uh, I just did one. I didn't see the point in having tattoos for the rest of my life for something I didn't believe in. Um, and plus I didn't see the sense in having, uh, you know, my John tattooed across my forehead and then go robbing a store with these guys. <laughs> <laughs> like there was one guy with glasses named John, just that's all I know. Yeah. So I just, and they would do things like that. That to me was just totally ignorant. Um, the day-to-day -day had a lot to do with alcohol, looking for alcohol, what do we do to get alcohol? Um, and that was really a lot of planning, a lot of planning, because most of us were underage. And the planning might be, okay, we'll pick up Ellie on the condition that Ellie run into this little convenience store and run out with uh, a case of beer. And that was your gas money, if you will. You get picked up, so you would steal something. And that was very, very common. Why, why alcohol as opposed to, I don't know, any other drug? I would guess because one, drugs were more expensive. Um, you could steal alcohol. You can't steal drugs from people that are, were armed with firearms, um, I would guess. Um, and because just like the whole working ethic, they would say that these other races races did drugs and that's all that they were good for that's that was that was their whole drive in life was just to be on drugs um so to an extent that was frowned upon however the american front the organization that i belong to started off as a fundraising organization for their drug habits right so they would say we're, we're fundraising and they would say what's it for <laughs> no you pay your membership dues ah and you would send in your membership dues and they would use that to buy drugs. Right. Or so the story goes that I was told the only reason I would buy into that is because one of the members, one of the founding members, David Lynch was later shot by another skinhead by later by I mean within the past few years because of something that dealt with methamphetamines. Right. Wow. Okay. Um, in, in the documentary, you, you mentioned how uh, one aspect of, of being in a gang was carrying out assaults. And um, in one instance, you said that, that you, you were beating a guy up and you had to turn off the switch to your conscience, which I thought was very interesting. What was that like and how did you manage to do that? Wow, how did I manage to do that? Um... The easiest way to describe it is you have to stop seeing this person as a human being. This was someone who had drawn a firearm on a group of my friends uh, at a place that we frequented quite often. And uh, I was requested, please get this guy out of there, but get, uh, get him out of there in such a way that he would never want to come back. And it was decided, okay, this guy's going to get beaten up tonight. And um, yeah, once the first punches were thrown and they were not thrown by me, um, I was just there as a part of the group, one of the guys. And being what, but I could see that I was being watched. It's like, all right, John, where are you at? What are you doing? Um, so as I would hit him and hear him scream, it's like, all right, <laughs> this is not something I like to feel. I do not like the way that this is transpiring. I don't like what's happening, but I also know that if I speak up in his defense, it's going to be me. And I saw that happen at parties where skinheads would stand up and say, no, this is wrong. This should not be happening. And then that skinhead took the beating. And to be very careful what you said and how you said it and to where and who was listening. You're really in a catch-22 because you don't want to hurt this guy. But at the same time, if you don't, they're going to get you. 
were 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 physical assaults a common thing that you were forced to take part in? Fortunately, no. A lot of close calls. One of the things that I, I very quickly I like to understand things, and I would try and figure out what scared me. And what scared me was somebody that would talk in a very level, calm, relaxed way, as if they knew something that I probably should know, but I don't know yet. And I saw that that scared me. And so what I did was that whenever we'd be surrounded by a group of people, I would try and talk that way or act that way, totally calm, totally relaxed, and just talk directly to the person as if you don't know what's about to happen to you. And as one of my good friends put years later, I never saw you fight, but I was terrified of you just because I saw how people would just disperse without you doing anything. I was like, well, God bless. That's <laughs> just mazal. What can I say? Mazal. <laughs> What, when did you turn your conscience back on? Was it as soon as the situation was over or was it when you were out of the gang? Probably to say when I was out of the gang. Um, now, mind you, during this period, I had friends that were shot. I had friends that were stabbed. We were all beaten up at least once. So there were times you'd find yourself in a fight, not of your own choosing, just because you look different. Somebody would jump you or stop their car and a dozen guys would get out and start punching you or beating you up. Um, sorry for the listeners and put my phone on mute. I'm expecting a phone call from, uh, medical people. Ah, oh, it's from Chabad. <laughs> okay. Um, how did I turn my, uh, my conscience back on? Turning the conscience back on was basically realizing that I wanted to see all people as people. And that the more that I started speaking to other groups, uh, of my own age, which at the time was in my teens, uh, to people that were adults that were asking me to please come and share my, my experiences, my story, that um, I was very much aware of the fact that I was very lucky to be alive. And um, you can't go through life dragging anger behind you and just a total lack of concern for your fellow humans while at the same time try and tell people, hey, you can't hate us, we're human beings, while at the same time think, okay, I can hate other people. There's a dichotomy there that you just can't can be a part of. So breaking any of my conscious back wasn't all that difficult. Yeah, I, I think this really goes back to that love that you were shown by your parents. Um, and it's interesting because you, you speak of this love that you were shown by your parents and, and it you know you say in the documentary that your dad was also a member of a gang i don't believe it was a neo-nazi gang but he was in his day a member of of a gang um to what extent do you think that his being in a gang influenced you in some way the only way that i would say that it influenced me my father's being in a gang long before i was born was his aggressive violent nature as i was growing up um that it's nice being in a situation, and again, you feel like you're protected. You've got these people to look out for you. And as a child in a situation where you do not feel safe, getting older, it's nice having people around you that make help make you feel safe, even though <laughs> they'll kill you the moment they find out you are, you are who you are. Um, if they've, you know, I couldn't wear my mug and David, my star of David back then, obviously, um, that, uh, you feel safe, but incredibly unsafe at the same time. Um, my father's background, I can't tell you how that in, uh, influenced me. Other than the fact that I just felt unsafe as a child. And I think that that played into it years later, getting involved with a group of guys that were tough. Yeah. Let's go to the night that the gang members found out you were Jewish. Let's kill me. Let's, let's kill me. So... So what happened there? How ha, take us to to the big start of the night and how this happened? The guys, I was ordered to an officers meeting in Daytona Beach, Florida, and when I got there, um, everybody was talking, was going from room to room. Every time I'd go into room, they would go into a different room, and people weren't talking directly to me; they would avoid me. And uh, I found that incredibly, incredibly strange because here I was a member in good standing to the best of my knowledge of this or this neo-Nazi organization. And I'm here at an officer's party that I was told I had to be at in the house of someone who was the Florida state leader for white Aryan resistance. 
So I'm thinking, okay, I'm supposed to be here. Um, I don't understand why people aren't talking to me. And a few times I walked into a room and they point firearms at me. And uh, yeah, <laughs> your face, yeah, your face is, was basically my face. Um, all right, guys, you know, what's up? What are we doing? You know, what's, I knew somebody was going to get hurt that night. I have no idea who. I didn't think it was going to be me. Um, two weeks before that night, they had shot another member for some other for some reason or another and had managed to convince law enforcement that it was an accident when they shot him. They shot five times, hit the guy twice, and managed to convince the police it was an accident. Wow. And so my night, one of the smarter ones was like, listen, if we shoot him, they're going to realize it's not an accident. We have to find another way to, for him to die. Uh, and that's when they started, I guess, a little brainstorming between their little alcohol storm. And that was, let's take him to the beach, beat him up and drown him. Yeah. And so they said, let's go to the sea. And I was like, all right, let's go. Cause I thought we could go down to the water. And once we got to the dark, the darkness of the beach, I could just get back in my car and leave and drive home, which was about 80 miles away, about 150 kilometers or so. Um, we got down to the sea. Once we're down at the sea, one guy punched me right behind my right ear. And when I turned to face him, somebody shouted out now, and the other six jumped on me. And so I had six guys punching and kicking me at the same time. And every time I'd fall to the ground, I would try and get back up because I knew when you're on the ground, they're going to do what's called a boot party and kick you as many times as they can. So I would kick, I was kicked in and out of unconsciousness numerous times. And I knew every single time what was going to happen that uh, these guys were not going to stop kicking. And I was not crying out for help. I was not crying out for assistance because I knew that they would also do something where they would mock whoever they beat up. They'd mock their cries. And so they cried like this. They shouted like this. They begged like that. Um, and when one of them shouted out, die, Jew boy, die, I was not going to give them the pleasure of dying like a, a weak Jew. So I shut my mouth. Uh, until one of them dragged me into the sea. When he dragged me into the water and they were still kicking me, at first I thought this is a gift because water slows down the kicks. So I thought, wow, these guys are you know, brainiacs. <laughs> Taking me into the water was the safest place for me. Um, it'll reduce the pain from the kicks that I'm getting. Um, and I looked into his eyes. When I looked into his eyes, I could see the hatred looking down at me. And uh, I knew then that uh, I knew what was coming next. And that's when I said, don't do this. Please don't do this. And uh, yeah, that was it. So you're looking in his eyes. You're literally begging for your life. Um, was it was it just one guy or a bunch that then attempted to drown you? This guy dragged me out, held me under the water, thought that I drowned. Um, and when he thought that I drowned, everybody walked away. Now, as they walked away, they turned on to look back and saw that I was still alive. At that point, one came back to talk to me and explain to me <laughs> what I thought had happened actually didn't happen. And it was something else totally that like I'd fallen out of the back of somebody's uh, pickup truck. And he said, just say so you got, you fell out of the back of a truck. And I said, no, you guys tried to kill me. And he said, just say so you fell out of the back of the truck. And I was in such a state of shock. I couldn't understand what he was saying was to be safe, shut your mouth, quit talking right now. If you want to stay alive, quit talking right now. Right. Um, and since I was trying to make sense of what happened around me, like I said earlier, I like to understand things. And at that point, one of the guys shouted out something that I was warned, I can't curse on your program, <laughs> shouted out something that was uh, relatively uh, strong. They, and they came running back, kicked me here hard enough to lift me up to my feet. And then everybody jumped on me again and they started kicking again. And uh, this time, two of them took me out, one side of my back, and one held me in a chokehold and they pressed my face down into the sand. I can tell you it takes two pulls of your diaphragm to fill up your lungs with water. The first pull, you feel the water come into your lungs and you push it out. And when you push it out, your body automatically pulls it in again. Um, and there I was thinking I'm a fish. Like the water would come back and forth. My lungs are expanding and collapsing with each wave. And uh, that's a very, very surreal feeling. You're, you're convinced that you're drowning at this point. Oh, you're drowning. You've already, you've already held water. You can feel the water. And again, when the waves would come back and forth, my lungs would expand and deflate. So where, what happens, how does it get to the point where they 
think uh, they 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 leave you. They walk away. They're convinced you've died, right? Correct. Okay, so they leave. You are passed out. How did you? I mean, how did you survive? How did you make it back to the beach? We have an expression in Hebrew called Baruch Hashem. Uh, if you can translate that, Baruch Hashem is just... Thank God. I guess, please. Exactly. Thank thank God. Um, there's, no, there's no way to describe it. There's no way to explain it. They pushed me and watched me float out to sea. Their testimony in court was that I was a, a foot underwater, which is a third of a meter, uh, with my eyes and mouth open, and they with my arms out to my side, and they pushed me and watched me float out to sea. As the tide was going out, and only then did they actually leave the sea. Only then did they leave the beach. I woke up above the shoreline. There's no explanation for it because the tide was going out. I woke up on the exact opposite place the tide should have put me. Um, got up. Now, anyone's ever been in a fight could tell you your glasses usually don't last very long. <laughs> I managed to find my car, get in my car, and uh, I had a spare pair of glasses in my car, first and last time I ever did that, and uh, made the drive back to my parents' house. Took a shower and went to bed. That must have been a long drive. I had a lot on my mind, man. (laughs) (laughs) I had a lot on my mind. I mean, there's another uh, Hebrew phrase, bashet, the fate. Um, there's an element of that as well. What, so, so what was it like when you regained consciousness and you're like, I'm here, I'm alive. Now what? I will make one important point. When I felt myself dying, um, it's like I was looking up through a tunnel and I could see myself being lowered into the ground and around my grave, people were talking. And different people were in my, the last thought that went to my mind was who is going to cry? Obviously your parents will cry. And you know, that one girl at school that cries every time her pencil would break. Um, but on a larger scale, no one's going to remember that you were here. You haven't changed the life of the positive. More people will be like, I'm glad that guy's out of here. Then uh, he touched my life. He did something. And I have to tell you that feeling of who is going to cry is the saddest feeling you can never feel because you realize that you're gone. To, you're here today. You're gone tomorrow. And no one will know. Mm. And that moment is probably, we talk about the conscious. That's when I wanted to be different or decided to be different for the rest of my living days. And when I got my life back, that's when it began. Uh, starting then being nice, being polite. Mm. It, 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 it was, it was really a miracle that you, that you survived. I mean, so you drove home and, and then your, I believe your parents take you to hospital. Doctors said to your parents, you have to say goodbye to your son. And then they later said to you, there's no medical reason you should be alive. That is heavy. I thought so too. Um, when I was told repetitively how, how much of a liar I was, because what I was saying to them could not actually have happened in the way that I said that it happened. And then uh, they started capturing some of the guys. And when they started capturing some of the guys, that's when they came back and said, dude, <laughs> this should, you should not be alive, man. You should really be happy, be thankful to somebody that you're here. Uh, you shouldn't even be here. And that's the beginning to actually believe what I said. Am I right in thinking that you still don't know how uh, the gang members found out you were Jewish? Well, I can tell you right now. I was, there was a girl that on the back of her neck, she had tattooed American front, which was the organization that I was in. Middle of the night, one night, I received a phone call telling me that they wanted that tattoo back, that she had stolen a lot of different things from their, their main office. And, uh, since she was from my city and was back visiting her mother in my city, that the responsibility fell on me as the local commander, if you will, to get them that tattoo. And effectively what they were saying was kill her, but giving themselves plausible deniability. Mm. That if I did kill her, that they could say, we didn't say kill her. We just said we wanted the tattoo. John just went crazy. We had nothing to do with that. That's John. 
uh, and they were always playing these little word games that they would say something and you'd, you'd get a command and always had to read between the lines of some of the commands that you would get. Uh, and I went to the girl and told her, listen, these guys want something, bad, want something bad to happen to you and they want me to do it. And uh, after we had a little conversation, she was the ex-wife of a very, very good friend of mine who knew that I'm Jewish. And so to save her own, her own life, she contacted a very scary, very crazy group of skinheads. Very scary, obviously. And said, listen, I know something about John you guys would want to know. And uh, yeah, spilled the beans. I saved her life and she tried to take mine. The, your attackers end up getting, it goes to court and they get convicted. And the people who attempted to murder you were imprisoned. And, and then when they were released, they made it clear that they would be coming to finish the job. This then prompted you to make Aliyah, to move to Israel. What did that process look like? Let's take a few steps back before we get into too much in Aliyah. Um, I knew Israel was where I wanted to be. Israel was where I would feel safe. However, I also knew that if I moved to Israel right away and didn't stay and stand up for all the court cases and testify, this was under uh, Florida's hate crimes law. This was a, a major, major event for the state of Florida and for the area that I lived in. This was not a small case against a small organization, a small group of people. And I heard that time and time again from law enforcement, what you're doing means X because you're the only one doing it. Um, that again, I knew if I moved directly to Israel, what I'm saying is if you attack a black person, you go to jail. You attack a Spanish person, you go to jail. You attack a Jew, he leaves the country. Mm. What message did I just send them? It's okay. Attack the Jews. Yeah. So I knew for us, I had to stand up and be there and go to every court case and deal with every threat that my, myself and my family heard during that period of time. I had a bodyguard. Every time I go to court, they would put an armed guard with me, an undercover policeman. When I would arrive at the county lines to go testify, there would be undercover police officers that would pick me up and then drive me to wherever, wherever it was I was supposed to be because I knew that my life was that much in danger. Um, but I felt like it was the right thing to do, so I stood up and did it. When it came time to move to Israel, I contacted the Jewish agency. When one of the last guys was getting out of prison, I contacted the Jewish agency, met up with the Shalia, who is, uh, works out, people moving to Israel, I guess, uh, the translation of Shalia, the emissary. Uh, so I met with him in Orlando, Florida, the same city uh, where my whole Scandinavian experience kind of sort of began and uh, had some articles about my whole case and put them on the table and said, listen, man, I need to get out of here. This is what's happening. This is what's going on. I need to leave. But like yesterday and uh, got the ball rolling. Mm. How long have you been in Israel now? Coming up in 26 years. Wow. When you think about your attackers now what is the feeling you have that's a hard question because there's so many different angles that can be taken and i hope they're well i hope they've changed their lives i hope they have some sort of peace with who they are and with the world that we live in um i know most of them don't i don't spend too much time thinking about them i think about the types of people that they are um, or were because that's what I talk on. That's what I warn when I go into schools. That's what I warn the faculty against. That's what I try and keep an eye out for. Um, I don't think about these guys per se, unless I'm researching them or looking into something about one of them, uh, based off of a question I might've gotten, like, are they still involved or something like that? And yes, they are. Some of them are not all of them. Some of them definitely still are. That there's, there's a great quote. Uh, which you say in the, in the, in the documentary, you, you say, no matter who you are or who you were, you can always become somebody else. Do you think that's possible for your former fellow gang members? Yes. Beyond a shadow of a doubt. I do not believe in putting people in a forever box that once you're there, you can never change because that removes from them the desire and the ability, the desire to want to be somebody different. Because you've just said you're going to be a criminal for the rest of your life. You're going to be an idiot for the rest of your life. You're going to be ugly for the rest of your life. You're going to be fat for the rest of your life. There are so many different things we can put on top of somebody and then say, that's who you are. 
and they get them self-identifying. And no, I do not want somebody self-identifying as a little Nazi forever. I would prefer to look at them and say, you know, you can change. There's a gentleman named Daryl Davis. Daryl Davis is well known because he, he befriends members of the Klan and skinheads groups. He's a black man, befriends them. And as he gets to know them, then building a friendship with them gets them out. And that's truthfully what I believe in. Just be a good person. And uh, you'd be surprised how that can affect those around you and change their hatreds. It's that there's a really nice part of, of, of the documentary is you sort of reunite um, with a former gang member called Kevin. Um, and y you and Kevin, you visit two uh, concentration camps. Uh, one is uh, Thierenstadt, uh, ghetto and concentration camp. And one is Auschwitz. And in the first, Kevin says that he signed the guest book and he just wrote, I'm sorry. And in the case of, and then you, you visit Auschwitz together and you say, going into brain surgery was easier than this. What were these experiences like for you, especially with one of your former gang members? When Kevin and I, when Kevin first started talking about this trip, what Kevin wanted to do was go to Europe and he wanted to go to one of the places that, uh, that showed the horrors of the Nazis and go and just say, I'm sorry for who I, what I once was. Excuse me. He said that was something that he really, really wanted to go do was just go and apologize for who he was and what he was once involved in. And said, I can't think of anyone better to do this with than with you. And um, on one hand, that's the perfect spiel to give me, to get me into a place where you could actually attack me and hurt me. So most of my friends and family were very much against meeting up with Kevin. Um, and to be honest, when I reached out to the director, Daniel Bray, who filmed it, I reached out to him just so I could have somebody else near me in case bullets started flying. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but maybe I could hide behind. I mean, we, we really, it was that, it was that way that we thought it was that close. Yeah. Um, is it real? Is it not real? We had no idea of knowing. We'd find out when we hit the ground. Um, there was one filmmaker here in Israel that decided to leave the project. Because of that? Well, why not? It makes sense. I might be flying someplace to go get killed because they were here in Israel for about a week interviewing me, just doing different background interviews and such before we were, flew off to Prague. Yeah, They beat me to Prague. And that's how they were able to film me coming off the plane and such. And they kicked me outside and I was sent outside of the airport. And then when I met Kevin for the first time and we go to the actual, where we were staying, the, uh, the crew started talking to me in Hebrew and said, you're not staying here with him. We don't trust him. You're coming to be with us. I said, no, man, I got to stay. I'm here with him. If this is real, I got to be here with him. And, uh, it was real. Kevin and I are in touch on a weekly basis ever since. Uh, more or less going into, uh, going into Auschwitz, the easiest way I can describe it, which doesn't make sense unless you've been there as you can feel the blood of our people crying out from the ground. And as a human being, being at that place, you just feel the evil and realizing that I was going in with somebody that had a swastika tattoo on his shoulder together with me wearing a mug and David. And if you watch the film, there's something you'll notice, but not, not realize what you're seeing. When we're in, uh, outside of Prague and uh, Terrazin, I carry a backpack. When we went to Auschwitz, Kevin always carried the backpack because he would not let the Jews work. Wow. Of all places, he would not let Jews work there. So he insisted to carry the backpack which had water and such like that, which he also refused. He refused to drink. He refused to eat because when we were there as a people, we did not have the choice of when we ate, when we drank. Um, so he decided since they didn't have a choice, I won't do it either. So Kevin really took it to the next level. And that touched all of us that were there as a part of the team. Um, that's powerful. Got it. That's heavy, man. Um, I want to ask how how do you think people end up getting recruited into white supremacist gangs in the first place? What is it they look for? 
I don't think people wake up and say, you know what, I want to be a racist today. I don't think that's how people get involved. Um, I was being driven to a venue one night and I was asked by the director of Hillel, a student, a Jewish student organization in the States, the same question. I said, I'll tell you what, stop at any pool hall or pub along the way and we'll recruit somebody. Look for the guy against the wall. Look for the guy by himself. And just go pay attention to him. Go be nice to him. That's probably what he's looking for. And that's what the skinhead groups do. That's how they recruit. They look for the person on the periphery that no one else is talking to. And they start empowering them by saying, listen, the reason why you're not succeeding at this is because of that. And they start saying all the failures in life are because of something else. And I look at that as being part of human nature. That's how the Torah starts off with uh, Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve. It wasn't me, it was her. It wasn't me, it was that. And they start, everybody's playing the blame game in the very beginning. And as humans, I feel like we do the exact same thing. Uh, that we say, uh, I wasn't wait to, late to work because I didn't get up on time. I was late to work because there was a traffic jam or the dog ate my homework. We go through life making up excuses instead of taking responsibility and accountability for our own actions. And um, the Scandinavians and racist groups just take that to an extra higher level by constantly, consistently, every failure in your life has nothing to do with you, but it has everything to do with them. And they have an answer for every single problem in your life as to why it belongs to somebody else. Um, and from that, it's when you start walking and feeling like you're a holy warrior. And that's that's what recruits people, that and the music, which plays in all those same little mindsets together. Mm. I want to talk about another um, huge part of your life, which is... Um your brain surgeries. So, so for a bit of background in 2009, three brain, yeah, three brain surgeries in 2009, you suffered a grand mal seizure, which led doctors to discover a brain tumor requiring you to undergo what is called a wake brain surgery, which is a rare operation in which 1% of people, uh, feel any pain. 1% of people, at least at my hospital, I can't say globally. I don't want somebody that's coming up to have brain surgery to think awake brain surgery to God forbid, hear this and be afraid thinking, Oh, this is going to happen to me. Brain surgery has come a long way since my first one. It's, it's such a small percentage in, in your, in that anyone should, should feel anything. And unfortunately something went wrong and you, you, you said you could feel them cutting you open. Uh, what, I mean, I, 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 I feel like saying what was that like is just a ridiculous question. But what was what was going through your mind when this was happening? How did you deal with this? To be honest, I screamed a lot. <laughs> uh, they knew what was going on. They knew I was in pain. There was nothing they could do about it, which I was aware of. Um, they were doing their best to try and minimize it. Um, yeah, it was just, it was brutal. There's nothing I can say about it. It was brutal. But they had to do it. They were saving my life in, in effect. And it's one of those things that if you have to hurt somebody to save them, you just have to keep going on hurting them. And that's what they were doing. Dude, you, you, you've since had two more brain surgeries. Making So you, you've had a total of three brain surgeries. How has this affected your life? Wow. It's affected every aspect of it, I guess. In 2009, when this first happened, I uh, ran for the Knesset here in Israel. Um, I was speaking in different places around the world and um, from the States to Russia, it just, it was awesome. I mean, life was great. I was working on my master's degree in Hebrew. So yeah, everything was great. My, bra my brain was fine, my body was fine. And then all of a sudden it wasn't. What they tried to do was get my seizures down. And they spent from 2009 to 2015 battling my seizures. And once they got those down to a relatively calm point was when I was able to make my first trip to Europe. And that was in July of 2015. And I've been going back several times a year, if not, if not once a year, several times a year ever since, wow. which has been awesome. And then coming back from my doctor's visits. Hmm. I want to, I want to get, you know, one way in which has really um, impacted your life and which was showcased on video. Basically, you were involved in, in a project with this Belgian artist, Carol Hutteburger. I'm sorry, I probably got it wrong. I'm sorry, Carol, who he runs this 
uh, project Saxo Pax, which is really cool. It takes World War One and World War Two artillery, melts it down, turns them into saxophones. And in 2018, he acquired a 1939 Nazi saxophone. And together, you took up the challenge of learning to play the music of George Gershwin on it, which was especially, especially difficult because of your brain surgery. The doctors removed the rhythm section of your brain. There's so much there. What did this project mean for you? The first time I saw the Nazi sax, I picked it up and shouted into the bell of it. We won, and then I put it back down. Um, what Carol was looking for, he was looking for an Ethiopian Jew, um, preferably a lesbian, somebody that was as far from what the Nazis would have liked as possible, black, LGBTQ, um, playing jazz, which was outlawed in 1935 because of, because of its association with Jews and blacks. So he was looking at the whole circle of what he wanted to do. In 1935, Jews were also outlawed, were outlawed from playing music in Germany. So he was looking to try and get as much of this as possible playing the Nazi saxophone to show that how much the Nazis had lost. One night we were talking and he's like, why don't you do it? I was like, yeah, why not? Okay. And, uh, in spite of the fact the music section was missing, I took a music class and this guy was like, all right, here's G and going through the various notes. I'm like, all right, cool. What key is that? That's all I need to know is what key. Here are the keys in the saxophone. Tell me where to push. That's all I want to know. Tell me where to push and how hard do I blow? And we went through that. And he was like, this is impossible. You're a crazy man for thinking you can do it. Um, I was practicing between three to six hours a day, every day, five days a week. I had six million standing behind me. This had to be done because it was an interesting way to let people know that we're still alive. We're still here. We're still out there. Um, you don't have to fight anti-Semitism just the one way that people tell you you have to fight it, that this would bring awareness to the fact that Carol had the saxophone and, and it pretty much lives under lock and key because he knows that it would, it's <laughs> Nazis would love to get their hands on it because it's an original 1939 saxophone stamped with the swastika and everything from the Luftwaffe in the German Air Force. So it's beyond the collector's item for collectors. Yeah. And uh, when you're playing on something that you know was used to get people all excited about killing your race and you're playing on it, the reason why we chose Gershwin, it was a very easy song to learn because they were like, look, we have a guy with the mental problem. <laughs> um, so we need something that's going to be easy to play. And that's why the song Embrace Play You was chosen. And when that was chosen, and I started doing more research into Gershwin, Gershwin passed away from a, a brain tumor. Wow. He's also Jewish. So I'm playing jazz music of a Jew by a Jew on a saxophone and the whole goal was to play one song one time in one place and it was played at the uh belgian um holocaust memorial my accompanist on a guitar was an arab so i really tried to fight as many stereotypes as possible at one time and it's very easy to see this you can google nazi saxophone project and you'll find it uh and the backstory and the little thing and there's no there are no sections where i play the song perfectly and that's by design because the Nazis would have demanded everyone to touch that saxophone do everything perfectly. And by design, I refused to do it perfectly. Because that's just getting, making them spend more in their grave, if you will. Sure. Um, uh, I do want to repeat, because I think it's worth uh, repeating. You did have the rhythm section of your brain cut out. So I think this is uh, an extraordinary feat for anyone, let alone for 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 someone who's who's gone through what you've gone through. So so really, I think it's amazing. In addition to 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 that project, you also, I mean, your regular sort of gig, so to speak, is you you're a motivational speaker now. You you go around and you give talks. How is that for you? What does that mean for you? Most of my speaking when I go places, it's. Uh... I'm horrific at uh, self-promotion because I feel like if somebody comes up to me and says, you need to hear what I have to say, my first answer is going to be like, nope, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
trust me, the enough people I can hear online, I don't need to hear you. What I want to hear is probably already on my phone. It's already set up. I don't need you. Um, so I don't self uh, publicize. What I tell people to do, if you're interested or if you were touched or you're moved, contact somebody and you tell them. And uh, that's how doors get open and that's how I go places. What it means for me is I want everyone to see that um, I talk a lot about ambassadorship. And I want people to realize that everything they do, somebody's watching it through some lens or another. I'm a guy, so if I do something against a woman, she sees a guy and it's gonna turn her against men to a certain extent. Um, I always wore my mug and duty, my star of David. So when people see me, they see a Jew. Um, so I always try and be the smiling, the nice and polite just so they don't see the, the guy that's a Jew who's also a jerk, that they see the exact opposite. They realize that we can be nice and polite. Um, and just, that's the way I try and do it. And that's one of the things I put into messages when I speak someplace. And of course, I always take the motto of whatever organization I'm working with. What are you fighting against? What's your biggest problem? And I make that a part of my research so that when I get up and speak, I can make everyone feel like we're all leaving this room as warriors together. Mm. John, before, you know, we're going to wrap up soon, but before we do, I, I, I want to ask you a question that I ask everyone, which is for those looking to help in the fight against anti-Semitism, and they may not know loads and they may not be Jewish. Um, where do you recommend that they start? First of all, I recommend you start with yourself. Um, find some kind of internal peace, number one. And when I say that, I, and it sounds really trite, but I can also tell you, I spent a lot of time watching the interviews and biographies of guys that used to be involved in racist groups and how they got out. They typically get out because somebody broke the pattern. Somebody was nice to them when they didn't expect it. That they're like, wait a second, all blacks are supposed to be like, but you're not like that. And that's what broke their pattern. And the same when it comes to Jews. Uh, a lot of people broke, their anti-Semitism was lost because they started, and that's, this is the what's called the long game, working with people of a long, an extended period of time. Um, barring that, definitely don't get into arguing online. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> That's just, it's a waste of your time. It's a waste of their time. And all you're doing is making a bunch of people upset. Uh, if anything, yeah, I believe in fighting fire with humor <laughs> rather than trying or sarcasm, rather than trying to go down to their level of being as aggressive because now you're as angry as that person. Is there any one single step to take to fight anti-Semitism? No, I don't think there is. I don't think there's a right way. There are definitely wrong ways. I think the wrong way is to argue online because that's what they're looking for. They're looking for you to fight against them. John, before we uh, close out here, please tell the listeners, what are you working on and where can people find you? My website is youbeginchange.com. Um, that's got most of the stuff about me, what I'm up to, where I'm going and, some things. And two days I fly off to Europe, to Belgium for a few months. Uh, well, depending on their whole visa allowances, I have a few schools that want me in there. I usually want to go speak in schools in Belgium. They have, uh, it's mixed groups. So it's Catholic, Protestant, Muslim, and atheist groups all together to hear this one crazy story about a Jewish kid. Um, there's apparently a graphic novel in the works and there's always somebody working on something somewhere. Yeah. But uh, a lot of it we have to make do ourselves. Sure. That graphic novel sounds awesome, by the way. Um, John, I, I think you're the absolute man. Thank you so much for coming on podcast against anti-Semitism. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And thank you to all your listeners, listeners that are listening and involved.